Um, so I'm talking about 3D visualizations purely implemented in Julia and OpenGL um, to get top speed. And my presentation is structured in the way that I first give you my, um, a demo of my software that I'm currently working on. Then I will um, tell you a little bit about the implementation and point out a few problems that I'm currently having and which I want to solve with a concept I've come up in the last half year. It's called HyperSignals. And from there on, I will give a short glimpse into the future, what I hope Jira will look like uh, with 3D visualizations in the far future. OK, so this is Osmosis, a chat client written completely in OpenGL and Julia. It's using Toxcore for communication. It's a really nice decentralized messenger API. And it's using GeoVisualize, which is my rendering API. And I have to thank Sebastian Bort, he wrapped Toxcore. And now you might be asking why I'm presenting a messenger, if it's about scientific visualizations. Um, it's a very easy way to actually show off the capabilities of GeoVisualize. I will show you pretty soon. And I hope that people will probably just use it without um, being interested in Julia itself or scientific computing. And then they get started there and start implementing high particle physics <laughs> or things like that. And I hope it will battle test basically the uh, visualization library so that we go get a lot of um, stability for it. So what can you do? It has um, all the basic features for a chat client. I can send um, messages like this. And I can actually evaluate Julia code in there, which looks like this. I just have a Julia string, and I'm creating a matrix. And I can just send it. And it will create a default visualization for a float matrix, which is a bar plot in this case. Um, you can just move it around, interact with it and actually change a few parameters that I have here, um, like these. Or normalize the color lookup. Um, you can send all kinds of um, data, for example videos, even HD videos. Oh, so this probably doesn't fit that well onto the screen. <laughs> It's by Max Cooper and Tom Hodge. I really like their music videos. And I hope at some point that you can do similar visualizations in Julia <laughs> with um, my library. That would be really awesome. But um, you can also drag and drop um, Julia scripts, which the last value gets evaluated. Um, this will definitely change at some point. You will see the Julia code before you actually execute it. <laughs> but <laughs> that would be nice, I guess. Um, so this is fully animated, the positions, the color, and everything. And this scales up to 40,000 particles for animations, and up to 1 million, actually, for just static particles. Um, I can... Ah, uh, yeah. Well, I show something else first. Um, it's a vector field. So every value is basically animatable in GeoVisualize. Um, I realized that with a nice um, library by Shashi, it's called Reactive. It's an event system. So you can change the color, the positions, and everything for most of the visualizations. And actually, you can even change the OpenGL shader program. Um, it's th that's, that's how this would look like. It's um, this one is for the one that I actually currently showed. So I can just edit it and update it. 
So now I took out the rotation matrix, so all the rotation is gone. And this is a really nice way if you're developing OpenGL code and you can get a nice access to the how to do visualizations on the GPU. And I have some more use cases. So the particle system is actually very flexible as well as this um, vector field. You can use any um, mesh for the particle. So you could actually, for example, use this mesh of a cat <laughs> for your particles. I don't know, it's probably not in most of the scientific visualizations, but <laughs> you could use planets or anything like that. And a fun fact about this is that the um, text rendering works very similarly. It's also a particle system which looks up um, the text, the glyphs, for every position. So if I actually enhance any of the particle um, infrastructure, everything will get faster and better. And if you see that, I, I can select text, so I could select the particles in a similar way. I have the infrastructure for that. I actually, this is a really rough prototype which I coded up in the last days, so <laughs> there are not a lot of features which I would have wanted. And you can actually also display volume data. So let's talk about a few use cases that I could imagine with this kind of messenger. You could probably just scan the volume and send it to your professor and talk about it, uh, the data and could probably do this with um, any other data and just have a very easy way of actually communicating um, with people of your, about your research that you're currently doing with actually sending them code samples and data. And you can interact with this as well here. Um, let me see. Yeah, the widgets are really bad yet. <laughs> okay, so you could probably step through the ISO values um, of this surface, uh, of the volume, like this. <laughs> Looks terrible. <laughs> and you can change the color of it. Oops. <laughs> yeah, it's a really rough prototype right now. And yeah. What else? I think that's about it for the messenger. And now I want to explain how I created this with, together with Reactive and OpenGL. It will be just a short overview over the, um, over the features. Uh, just about the event system. So I don't know if you're familiar with Reactive by Shashi. It's a really nice way of building callback graphs. Um, so you have a value which um, is a signal and every time it changes it calls all the callback that are um, registered to it in a really nice functional way. So in the, in the case of osmosis I get text messages from Toxcore from the interweb and I can pass these if it's a Julia string. I can get values of it, um, Julia values and then I can upload them through the video card and there I can load them into the shader object. So the shader ob um, object is just the program you saw before in written in OpenGL shading language. And you can load in a, a few additional parameters like the mesh that gets instanced in this bar plot for example. And for example a color map to look up color values for the height of the bars. And the really nice thing is that everything is a signal in here so everything can change. So the 3D mesh could come from a database and could update the um, 3D mesh or the color could be updated per, per widget or you could have um, the positions or the heights of the bars you could have them from a simulation and it 
could even be just a GPU object. I think that's not really possible in any other visualization library that you can just take native um, GPU objects and directly visualize them without downloading them to the CPU, which enables you to um, be really fast if your simulation library or physics library is already on the GPU. And, but there's a big problem in here. Uh, there's this no Julia zone. It's <laughs> really scary in there. Uh, low level OpenGL and you work on the graphic cards. You lose all the features, the nice features of Julia. And there, so you have reactive out there and Julia and everything is really nice and then there's a clear cut and then suddenly you're <laughs> in OpenGL. And I don't really like that. That's one of the problem. And there are other problems right now. It's not multi-threaded yet, because we don't have real threads in Julia right now. And the event system has some overhead, which I would like to get rid of. And yeah, I already told you, the signals don't extend to the GPU, so it's really hard to implement events on the GPU. So if the physics simulation is done with the simulation step, it's really difficult to send an event to the visualization library to just update the visualization. So it would be nice if the event system actually extends to the GPU and does this there. Yeah, and all this management of memory and GPU events and stuff like this is really hard <laughs> and complicated and no one really would like to do this. So I have a concept for that to solve these issues. The reactive event graph actually holds a lot of information. It holds all the functions you want to call on some data type. Uh, it tells you in which order you want to call them or need to call them and because you're in Julia, you can actually get the abstract syntax tree of these callbacks. And this gives you a lot of information which you could analyze. You could see if the function, if there's an implementation that would actually run on the GPU. And if you figure out this, you could probably move a whole branch of the event system to the GPU, which would, would make things very fast. And you could figure out if there are reads or writes or if it has side effect. This is probably a little more complicated, but we could implement this with metadata or keywords, additional keywords. And if we have that, we can enrich the callback and um, actually splice in download or upload calls to actually upload the data to the GPU. Or we can um, put memory fences up if we actually figure out that there are reads and writes to some memory. And we can, if we find out that the computations are not um, connected, we could probably just automatically initial, initiate parallel calls. And if we did this, we can um, recompile the whole event graph, which is um, similar to unrolling a loop. So we have this, I think in reactive, it's a heap. The, it's a heap structure where you have the callbacks. And then you go through the heap and call the callbacks. And that's actually where the overhead is coming in from. If you could just unroll this and have the calls just compiled out, uh, we could get rid of this um, lookup overhead in the event system, which would be really fast in the end. But Hyper Signals itself actually doesn't solve the no Julia zone problem. We are still stuck with this. So we have Julia on the one side, and then at some point you just stop using Julia, and you're just starting to make call to C APIs, which then um, which is probably OpenGL or OpenGL ES or OpenCL. So these are very similar APIs. Um, OpenGL is for graphics. OpenGL is for ES is for graphics on the mobile. And OpenCL is for general compute on the GPU. And OpenGL does some general compute in very uh, in newer versions. OpenCL could do some graphics, but it actually can't render to a, a screen buffer. So, and it doesn't support rasterization. So you, you have to use both if you want to get the best out of both worlds. And then if you even want to go to the mobile, you even need OpenGL ES, which is just a subset of OpenGL. So it's really an annoying <laughs> infrastructure. 
And Kronos, the creators of these APIs, they actually realized that as well, that they are very similar, but still are not compatible that well. Um, so they actually made something, uh, came up with something very nice, which will help us to get rid um, of the no Julia zone. It's called Spear V, V for Vulcan. I kind of have the feeling that this is a reference to Lord of the Rings, <laughs> because it's the one thing that rules them all. Um, they want to make OpenGL and OpenCL and OpenGL ES compile to Spear V. It's an intermediate representation, which is a little bit similar to LVM's intermediate representation. And it's supposed to have backends for all kinds of architectures. So Spear Vulkan is supposed to run on the GPU, on a desktop and server GPU, on the CPU, but also on ARM and on the mobile. And because we, with Julia, actually use LLVM, um, we, have, we can also compile to LLVM uh, the intermediate representation. And Kronos wants to publish a converter very soon from LLVM ER to Spear V. So in the future, we could probably directly compile from Julia to Spear V, which would open up a lot of possibilities. We could do the whole graphic stack in pure Julia, and we could do all the um, GPU computing in pure Julia, which is really nice because if you compare some um, function from the OpenGL shading language. Um, it's a very simple language, it's a C dialect. And if you compare that with Julia, how you could program in Julia, it's a lot simpler. So all these functions there pretty much do the same. And I needed to copy and paste them and just change the type because it doesn't have the multiple dispatch of Julia with parametric types and inheritance. But in Julia, this could be all just one function. <laughs> so, if we would have this, my um, whole GL Visualize stack would shrink considerably and would be a lot less complex. A lot more people could actually contribute because things would get a lot simpler and everything would be not a lot nicer. And actually, Julia is in the pole position for um, Spear Vulcan because it's, first of all, it uses LLVM. I mean, there are some other languages that use LLVM but I believe that Julia is a better fit for um, 3D visualizations and for parallel computations on the GPU because of its functional style, which is um, really good for parallel computations and all the mathematics that we need um, for the graphics. And I think Julia offers a very nice alternative to object-oriented programming, makes code a lot more shareable Mm, but that's a whole different topic, I think. <laughs> and it's optimized for scientific computing. So in scientific computing, you need a lot of visualizations. If you have simulations of magnetic fields or things like that, um, you want to visualize them, you want to see them. And because a lot of these probably run on the GPU, we had that talk before, um, that, and then you already have the data on the GPU, so you want to visualize it and stay on the GPU. And with all these use cases, we are already prepared for this kind of work. And yeah, it's obviously more concise than, um, especially than low level OpenGL code. So I think we are looking forward to a very nice platform for 3D visualizations, uh, together with Spear V, Julia, and HyperSignal and GL Visualize. I think it will enable a lot of cool use cases. And now the big question is what needs to be done to get this running. It's quite a lot, so it won't be probably in the next year or two. Uh, we need to preserve GPU memory address space, and we need to get LVM small vectors running. I think that's actually mostly done. Also the setting LVM the backend up, thanks to Valentin and Tim. They did great work, but a lot more people contributed to making this possible. So actually, right now, you can <laughs> compile to a 
NVIDIA backend, which is a little bit, uh, it's a similar um, intermediate representation. And you could actually compile Julia functions right now already for the GPU. It's a work in progress, so it's probably hard to install and <laughs> probably doesn't work all the time, but it's already there. So then what else do we need? Uh, we need additional keywords in Julia because Spear V has a lot of GPU specific things that it actually exposes. So we need some way to address that from Julia. And then obviously we need to integrate the Spear V converter. Um, I don't really know how much work that will be. It depends on how Kronos will, how it will look like in the end. It's probably just about enabling a target or something like that. And much more is on the way, I think. What we cannot really say right now. And I think all in all, we are looking forward to a very bright future, future um, with running apps which are native with really high performance on all kinds of platform. So we could actually um, have this, these things, for example, the chat line run on the mobile, on a mobile phone, or you could do some statistics and data, data visualizations on a tablet or on a big cluster. And I think it will be all on a very solid basis for heterogeneous computing with Julia. And that's it from my side. Um, do you have any questions? Questions? Yes. Ah, yeah. Um, Jack asks um, if I can just show the source code for the spiral of the particles that moved. Um, I can definitely do that. It's pretty short. It could be actually shorter. It's just um, I want to use as much Julia data types as possible and then map as directly as possible to the GPU. So you just need to create an array of points. So the points are the positions of the particles then. And then you can create a signals of this array. And I'm really happy that Reactive is fast enough to do this. So you can actually make a signal of a very large array which just moves. And then you can directly visualize this. So this is um, the lift operation from Re Reactive. This is the function that actually creates the particles. And this is a little helper function I wrote, which just make a, makes a timed signal, just sends bounces between 1 and 10 with the steps of 0.1. And then you get moving particles out of this. And then you ca could actually specify here um, the primitive, which could be any 3D mesh, for example, the, the 3D model that you can load. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.